Hey everyone, welcome to Kitchen Party. Do do I get do I get any kind of like? Ooh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I th I thought you were frozen. I thought. It was... <laughs> have, have we started? I'm just, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was Go ahead. sleeping. <laughs> Continue. Go ahead. I know Jeff is not here today, but doesn't mean we need to. <laughs> Uh, rely on our laurels. What's, what's the term? <laughs> Rest on our laurels. Rest upon Rest your laurels, on our yes. laurels. Rest on our laurels. So welcome to Kitchen Party, everyone. Those of you who are hello, watching. Hello, hello. Hey, Jeff just came in. Hey, Jeff. Welcome. Uh, you know, is it is it just me, or are you just trying to make, like, a statement and come in just as we begin? He's trying to steal everyone's thunder. Diva. Really. Diva. <laughs> Look, he can't we even can't say hear you yet, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can now so make fun of him. He can't say anything, which is really good. That's right. All right, everyone. So How are we doing? we're doing great. Hey, Jeff. So glad you can make it. Jeff, where are you located? I am at the Ritz Carlton in Sarasota, Florida, at the new Jack Dusty restaurant that uh, they just opened actually 20 minutes ago. Fancy pants. I'm on location. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey, do me a favor. When we start the show, mm -hmm. oh, obviously we've, we've already started, but uh, you may want to you may want to mute your mic every once in a while, just because it looks like it's too much fun, and that's much more fun than what we're having right now. <laughs> it's making us feel bad. It's I'm making like, us feel very bad. Jeff, are you drinking anything? Uh, not yet, but when the show ends, I'll be drinking heavily. So. Nice. Excellent, excellent. Well, welcome again to Kitchen Party. Kitchen Party airs every Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. We bring one of our favorite people in food to come and talk. And also, new for this season is, for every show we produce, we are producing a community cookbook with recipes submitted by you, and you, and you, and you, and you. <laughs> Um, we will put the link within the show notes, and we will also put the link uh, during our break. Uh, you can go to bit.ly slash slow cooker cookbook is the page that you add your recipe to. So if you want your recipe to be included in our show cookbook that we're going to produce based on this episode, uh, please head over there. You can head over there tomorrow, today, whenever, and add your recipe. So... Slow cookers. That is the topic of today's show. And we are so fortunate to have Rachel Rappaport, who is the head blogger, awesome extraordinaire of coconutandline.com. And she's also a cookbook author as well. Rachel, say hi. Hi. <laughs> welcome, then, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. I love your I love your dining room. I love the walls. Thank you. It's behind me is um, a bunch of pictures we took at farmers markets around the world. Oh, that's great! Nice frame, so. That is super cool. Well, let's let everyone introduce themselves. So, uh, Douglas, do you want to start, and then we'll go to Jeff, and then Renee. Sure. I am Douglas E. Welch, and you can find out all about me at my website. I blog on food, gardening, careers, technology, and much, much more. More than you ever wanted to hear, I'm sure. Uh, again, you can reach me at douglaselwelch.com. I'm Jeff Houck. I'm the food writer for the Tampa Tribune, and I blog at tbo.com. I do a blog called The Stew, and uh, I apparently have the ability to hook up in remote locations at a moment's notice. So uh, hopefully this all all go well, uh, and no one will get hurt, and I'll be able to um, maybe in, enjoy myself. So. <laughs> I'm Renee Lynch. I'm a writer and editor at the LA Times. I write across a number of the feature sections, including TV and food. And uh, happy to be here to talk slow cookers. Renee, are you drinking tonight? Oh, am I drinking tonight? But, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you you <laughs> insult me with that question. You insult me. <laughs> You're dead to me. Dead. Dead to me. <laughs> Douglas, do you have a drink? I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being my usual good self. I have my, my, my diet soda this evening, so that you know, will have to suffice. You Those of you who are watching the show should know that we have a drinking game. Every time somebody uses an accent... You uh, drink whatever you got. I you, do not understand what you mean. You see right there. Drink. <laughs> you know, you guys can't see it, but off to my like side right here, literally, like her nose is at this line, is one of my cats. I don't know if you can see it. She may jump on me. <laughs> I'm like bracing her. I'm like with one hand going, please, please don't, please don't come near me. Oh, wait. Here she, here she comes. Here, kitty, 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 kitty. She wants to drink. Can you see her face? Oh, she's in the Aww. Hello, Gracie. Kitty makes an appearance. Hello, Gracie. Um, 
do you guys have uh, slow cookers? I have three slow cookers, including a little <laughs> tiny, a little tiny baby one that you could put gravy in, like a little gravy boat slow cooker. I love it. Isn't that kind of overkill? No, it's not. Not Ra at all. Rachel, you have eight. Eight, eight slow cookers. Well, I did a slow cooker cookbook, so <laughs> oh my I did have three slow well, cookers day in like at once. So I have eight. I have everything from the one and a half quart up to six, with different sizes and shapes and everything. And I kind of want one. They have they reissued the original slow cooker with like the original print and everything on it. So I'm sort of tempted to go for number nine. I'm like, what if one of mine breaks? I only have one round one that falls <laughs> over. What if something happens to it? I really want it. I went to the Smithsonian at a slow cooker like exhibit, like a little section in their new food exhibit, and they had the original one. It has like little lobsters dancing on it. I was like, yeah, I might have to break down and buy number nine, which is insane. Really that, that's like the survivalist, survivalist slow cooker methodology. What happens if one of them breaks? <laughs> Now. You never know. You're, you're, a, you're a slow cooker prepper. Right? <laughs> I know. Like they're ridiculous. I have like a slow cooker room in our basement with like shelves and it's like all lined up. Uh, I Rachel, just posted a picture. Oh, go ahead, Douglas. Oh, no. I was just going to say I just posted a picture of my 1982 vintage rival crock pot. Ooh. That was a cool one. Actually, that brings up a good point. Uh, we are doing a Twitter contest today on this show. So follow the hashtag Kitchen Party. And if you either tweet a picture of your slow cooker or tweet a message to Rachel, which is Coconut Lime is her Twitter handle, um, with the hashtag Kitchen Party, she is giving away one copy of her new cookbook that comes out oh, next week. Woo! I love that. That, that is, looks so pretty. Can it's I get in on that? Can I get in on that? Something. So, this is my second slow cooker book. So, insane. Well, for, first of all, how do you store your slow cookers? Because you have nine of them or eight of them. I have a special shelving unit in my basement. <laughs> in an old house in Baltimore City, and we got one of those IKEA metal shelf things, and it's slow cookers on the top, and then the bottom is canning pots because we don't have any other place to put those things. So. It's my, uh, it's it's insane, but you should see it because everyone knows I have them. We even have one of the ones that makes three at a time. I might even be up to nine already. I forgot to include that one. But where you can do like cook three different things, and they all have like the special time thing. So like every time like someone has a party, they're like, "What's Rachel bringing me a slow cooker?" And, like, they borrow my slow cookers and stuff because you know I have like everyone possibly want. So. I keep seeing it's a hard to store. They do get dusty. Oh, yeah, I could imagine. I keep seeing Renee's picture come up because she's typing, and I'm like, yes. what I'm is sorry. <laughs> I was tweeting. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, everyone follow Renee. Renee is at Renee. Uh, Renee Lynch is her Twitter handle, so go see what she tweeted just now and retweet it. Um, let's talk about, uh, you know, a little bit of the backstory of, um, of how Rachel started her blog. When did that happen? Um, well, I started the blog in 2004. So the dark ages, basically, of food blogging. Um, started in 2004. I had just started dating my husband, and we were, like, cooking a lot. And I thought, oh, this would be a great way to keep track of my recipes. And I had had, like, other blogs since, like, the late 90s. So blogging was not too foreign. So I thought, oh, that'll be fine. But I didn't think anybody would, like, ever read it because nobody was writing about doing food blogs. So, like, a couple, but not a whole lot. It wasn't, like, a thing. So I just thought, oh, it'll be fun. Why not? But um, then I just kept like going and going and going, and for a while I was posting a different recipe every other day, and that was insane. So the last couple of years I've been doing like three days a week. So, but yeah, so we're going on like nine years now. So that's does it a long get easier? Time. Does it get easier towards the ninth year as it was like the first couple of years, or uh, is it? It's easier one way because like I can you know I. I sort of, you know, what to do, but it's harder sometimes because I'm trying to think, since I don't post recipes that are, like, found online anywhere else or in newspapers or books, and I just, like, make up stuff in the kitchen and write it down and then type it back up and stuff, it's hard because I have to come up with something new all the time, so. And why did you decide to do that, Rachel? You you say on your blog that you don't use any newspaper or magazine no. recipes. Why is that? 
Well, I thought, well, I started to sort of like be sort of like creative in the kitchen and make different things. And I've always, well, what I always think it's kind of like copyright. I don't think it's really appropriate to like post other people's verbatim sort of work and stuff like that. And so when I started, nobody was really food blogging. And I just thought, oh, this will be fun. You know, I'll come up with fun stuff to do in the kitchen and then I'll post it. And then, you know, I just kind of liked it to do something different. You know, I go to the grocery store and pick out ingredients and then. It kind of forces me to make something new because I can't just like, you know, open up the New York Times and be like, oh, they're making lentils this week. Let's go buy lentils. Like, you know, today I went to the grocery store and I'm like, oh, they have mussels. Well, I guess that's what we're having for dinner. And then I like see what else I can get, you know. So, so um, what is, where does that background come from? Did you grow up with, uh, with uh, parents who were teaching you how to cook or how, how did you learn uh, that, uh, that spontaneity? Really. Um, my parents always, my mom always cooked a lot. Uh, my grandfather... Um, cooked a lot, and he would make, you know, kind of simple stuff, but he did a lot of, like, from scratch cooking and stuff, so I saw a lot of people cooking, but um, no one really, like, taught me. I mean, we'd make, like, a cake together or something like that, but, you know, you have to eat, and <laughs> so, you know, I was, like, living by myself. My husband likes to cook a lot, too. He's a really big cook, so, you know, we were doing a lot of cooking, so, like, I just sort of, like, practiced, you know. I thought, well, I mean, what's the worst that could happen, so... You know, I haven't poisoned anybody yet. Oh, so. the worst! The worst that could happen. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that can, can get pretty bad sometimes. So. <laughs> well, luckily, nothing's happened yet. So, um, but yeah, I just thought you know it's you know something fun, and I like trying different things and different foods. And when we go on vacation, we go to different grocery stores wherever we go. We've been to like grocery stores every vacation. It's like the first thing we go to. So. Uh, we always get searched by customs on our way back, so <laughs> it's really funny. As well, you know, the, I, I was kind of wondering how you how you um, were able to, because I, I I really think the blog is is incredible. I I'm wondering how you took sort of this um, old lady hat club utensil kitchen uh, gadget and sort of updated it and refreshed it because I mean. It, it's not like they've made brand new technology beyond, you know, digital timers or anything like that. How did you approach it where it didn't seem dated? Well, what I was really trying to focus on was using sort of like fresh ingredients because so many slow cooker books, even ones coming out like today, it was like dump a can of soup, dump another can of soup, dump in some branch dressing, dump in bottled salad dressing and then like you shake it and that's just kind of disgusting like I would never eat like that generally so what I started doing is just sort of thinking of things I would make on the stove or in general like I don't get too crazy I'm not making like brownies in the slow cooker but like thinking about things <laughs> which I've seen um, but you know I just started thinking like what could I make that like the slow cooker would be like a good environment for also I mean like obviously chili and soup and things like that um, but, I mean, I've made, like, oatmeal, you know, it's, it's sort of just trying to think of, like, what would I normally want to eat, but maybe don't want to have to come home and make, like, after work or, you know, whatever, after a long day. So, yeah. Tell us about how you came up with the uh, fotisserie chicken recipe, which I, I saw on the blog and I absolutely adored because it's not cooked in liquid, right? It seems like if I was no. reading the recipe correctly, the, well, you tell it. Okay, well, what, when I was doing the first slow cooker book, the Everything Healthy Slow Cooker, I realized while making 300 recipes in the space of about three months that if you cook meat on a bed of onions, you can, like, it sort of steams it, and you can, like, lift it out, and then all the grease and grossy stuff stays on the bottom, and the onions sort of, you know, they give off liquid, so then it, they kind of, like, steam almost in the bottom, and then it keeps everything out from the disgusting fat that apparently normally people were just eating. Um, <laughs> so um, I thought, well, that would totally work for a chicken if you had one that would fit into your I, – I have so many slow cookers. Of course, I had one a chicken would fit into. But um, it was the same sort of thing. You put the onions down, and I, I had done it with, like, a beef roast, and I had done, like, a dry, really thin brisket, like, taco, where I had done onions on the bottom and then a brisket and then – tomatillos on top, which was kind of exciting. And then I thought, well, of course, why wouldn't that work for, like, chicken? So it did. You don't get the crispy skin, which is a little sad. But it doesn't get, like, soggy like some slow cooker recipes. Some slow cooker recipes, the skin gets kind of rubbery. It really doesn't do that because I think the, you put the salt and the dry rub kind of, like, sucks the moisture out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the both worlds. So you kind of get the meat steaming but the skin drying out. So you know, the best you can get in there. 
I, I like that recipe in particular because I like to use my slow cooker to poach chicken. And yeah. uh, I just feel like it make, it keeps it like really, um, really juicy and uh, I don't have to worry. Normally I'll put uh, chicken uh, in, in a boiling pot of water and like walk away and <laughs> forget about it. Oh, but yeah. You don't forget about it in the crock pot. You, you it and my and wife. Perfect, you, know? right? <laughs> you and that, my wife. Yeah, it's great. If it boils over, it's done. <laughs> exactly. And I loved I love poached chicken, so I kind of that's one of my favorite things to do with my slow cooker. Yeah, it's great. And then, you know, it's so, it's like such a passive way to cook too. So like, you know, you have the whole chicken and then you could like eat the chicken for the rest of the week, but you really didn't have to do anything to it or pay attention to it like at all, which I enjoy. So, you know, I like not having to pay attention to that sort of thing. You don't have to worry about drying out. Well, as Jeff was saying, it, it sounds like an old-fashioned, you know, cookery method, but the reality is, you know, from everything you read and everything in our own lives, we're busier now than we ever were in the past, and we're busier in different ways where, uh, you know, you have family members running in a hundred different directions to pra this practice and that practice and this rehearsal and the other and to work and everything else. It only makes sense that the slow cooker would kind of come back into its own in that sort of environment. Oh, yeah, I think it's perfect for that. I mean, you're not supposed to just keep it endlessly running. People ask me this all the time, where the people, like, want to, like, scoop out some chili and then, like, keep it on so that when Timmy comes home from soccer, he's also scooping it out, and then it just stays on for a billion hours. That's how you, like, die of food poisoning. <laughs> but <laughs> it will cook while you're doing other things. At some point, it does need to get turned off, though, but I get... So many people writing and saying, is it okay if I just have it a warm for 10 hours because it's done? No, please don't do that to yourself. And you really shouldn't be putting frozen food in there either. Just a little aside. You really shouldn't be cooking frozen food. Yeah, when people ask me that, I always like, well, it's okay for you to do that. Do you mind, like, being in the bathroom for a week? You, know? <laughs> yeah, you make I mean, the choice. It out for you one time, but I don't think you should chance it, really. Now, what's, uh, what was your natural natural evolution between, you know, you kind of figuring it out in terms of what, what it could and couldn't do, figuring out the sort of like the master recipes, for lack of a better word, and right. then um, going from playing, you know, chopsticks to playing Purple Haze. When was the moment that you kind of decided, okay, I can be really creative with this? Um, I think when I, I think when I realized, too, that I could do, like, even weird stuff like fish, and stuff in it, like, I was just, like, at a certain point, you start getting kind of punchy, and you just start, like, trying stuff, and when I was writing the first book, it was, like, 300 recipes, and he made you submit recipe titles, I had to submit that to my publisher, my editor before, I actually was testing the recipes, I had to send them hundreds of recipe titles, so that meant I had to sort of reverse engineer the recipes, because I came up by, like, say, 300, I was starting to just, like, say words, you know, so it was like, granola, that would be awesome. And then, like, I had to figure out if I could make granola, or I'd be like, bread pudding, sure. And then I had to, like, come up with bread pudding. So that was interesting. Um, but, yeah, so I, after I was able to do that, then I sort of figured out that, you know, it kind of, um, you know, then I sort of felt like, okay, well, I really could make stuff. I probably could make brownies in a slow cooker. If that, that was, was the revelation for me was that it was also a baking device because of the concentrated heat. And I always yeah. thought of it as stews and soups and beans and things like that. But when you look at it, you can make cornbread, and I'm like, okay, I am there. You know, that's my yeah. kind of appliance. I've seen the no-knead bread movement move over to slow cookers, too. That no-knead bread, actually, because it is so moist, actually lends itself quite well to a slow cooker. It's basically what they've been doing with the pots in the oven just over time. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, I like it. I mean, it seems sort of, like, stodgy or whatever. When I first, when I got my first slow cooker, I got it as a wedding present for my mom's elderly neighbor. And I thought, huh, that's neat. And I made it a couple times. <laughs> and then I ended up doing the whole book. So, like, now I think, I, I think I've think i actually made slow cooker stuff in my sleep. Like, I think I've gotten up in the morning and, like, made things and not being entirely sure what's in there. One time there was pineapples in something, and I truly do not remember adding pineapple. <laughs> so I feel like literally I could cook an entire meal in my sleep in a slow cooker. Hey, Rachel, you know, I'm really curious to know how you went from uh, – writing the blog to getting the cookbook deal happen. Did you pitch the cookbook deal? Like, did you pick slow cooker recipes, or did you, were you approached by a publisher, or how did that work out? Well, what was interesting was that I had been writing recipes for, like, companies and stuff, but not, like, a cookbook yet. So I was doing some, like, corporate recipe development, that kind of thing. And um, I was 
um, my a friend of mine, um, Cinnamon Cooper, wrote the Everything Cast Iron Skillet cookbook. Cinnamon Cooper is the best name for a cookbook author ever. And she was writing the Cast Iron Skillet, skillet and they asked her, they're like, hey, would you, you know, would you be interested in a slow cooker book, or do you know somebody? And she's like, oh, well, my friend Rachel might be interested. You know, she does this recipe development stuff. So then they had me pitch them, like, an idea, because they were looking for, like, slow cooker books and a couple other sort of, like, healthier versions of stuff. And I was like, well, I could do, like, a healthy slow cooker, I think, because that's kind of how we cooked anyhow. So I thought, well, I could do that. So it wasn't exactly like they approached me. It was sort of like an in-between kind of thing. They were like, oh, well, here's the person you could pitch to if they're interested. And then they were. And so I ended up doing the slow cooker one, and then I did a, um, a not slow cooker cookbook for them too. Now, now, when you get done doing a cookbook, are you, do you have to go through like a purging process where you're like, if I see another slow cooker, I'm going to kill myself? <laughs> or do yeah, you... it's, <laughs> it's tricky. I generally finish a cookbook and then I buy myself an expensive purse and then I uh, don't eat slow cooked foods and then I slowly get back to it. But one good byproduct is, like I said, I can really do slow cooking like really quickly so like if we're really busy like my husband has surgery coming up and I was like oh you know we're having a slow cooker because I have to like he can't drive so I have to drive everywhere I'm like oh it's gonna be slow cooker the whole week because you know if I have to drive I'm not making dinner too so um, just, just as a reminder everyone uh, if you're following the uh, kitchen party hashtag on Twitter I will be checking those questions in a few minutes um, nobody can hear my cat purring right no because <laughs> as it gets, as she gets louder and louder and louder. I'm like, go away, go away, go away. Now, uh, so when does the book? Can you tell us a little bit about the new book and when does that come out and and the what makes it book. different than the first one? Sure, the new book is supposed to be out. Um, they said at the end of January, but from what I see on Amazon, it looks like it's starting to ship the next few days, next week. Might be already out for the Kindle um, because someone already reviewed it. So somebody besides me has read it. Um, it's a collection of, I'll show it to you again, it's a collection of mostly um, some of my recipes. Um, it's about a third to half my recipes and then a bunch of recipes from other people from the publishers, um, other slow cooker books from other books. So it has some from my second cookbook too, which just happened to have some slow cooker recipes even though it wasn't a slow cooker book. Um, and some other recipes. I think you can tell which ones are not my recipes because they use ingredients like ketchup that I don't eat. But <laughs> um, not even if you make it yourself. What? <laughs> not even if you oh, make it I yourself. Made, I made oh well, I made plum ketchup <laughs> and I made um, beet ketchup. So I will eat that, but regular tomato ketchup. But yeah, I'm like I could tell that like you know which recipes aren't mine. But there's a ton of my recipes in there, and then it's sort of filled in with recipes from other cookbooks. So they're not all healthy. I did the healthy ones. Someone, other people did some of the other ones. And but I wrote the introduction and things like that. So I gave you a lot of good slow cooking information in the beginning. I think everyone. Oh, Douglas, I think everyone should realize that when she says a third of the recipes are hers, that's actually a lot because there are 700 total recipes in the entire cookbook. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. <laughs> like a By third. the way, I'd like to congratulate you on not being the, on, on being one of like the five or six people I've actually met who from the blogging world who actually make their own stuff. Make the, They write their own recipes. They come up with their own stuff. And it seems like I just keep seeing one dish go from uh, here. You know, I see a lot of people do it the, the, the right way on places like Bake Space and whatnot, but I see a lot of people kind of cribbing from each other, and I, I'm like, well, I've seen that before. I, uh, it sounds familiar, but yours seems so like somebody who actually loves to use it instead of just somebody who wants to make a book. Yeah, yeah, well, I really do. I really do like making stuff. Like we were just saying, right now in the blog, I have a bunch of recipes every year. My husband and I have a different decade themed dinner. So this year is the 20s. We're working our way back. We do movies. We play the games. This year we had to play yo-yos because that was the big game of the 20s. So uh, <laughs> I made pineapple. I know it's so nutty. I made pineapple upside down cake. I made. Um, we have green goddess dip coming up. Um, a ladies that lunch sort of platter was one thing. I also did um, oh homemade French fries because they came back from World War One. Um, White Castle burgers because they were very popular and stuff. So I did that. So I, I like doing that kind of theme stuff. Last year it was the 30s, did a bunch of stuff. We've been working our way back since the 80s, which was um, pesto pizza with sun-dried tomatoes. 
So we've been working our way back very slowly. So, but that kind of keeps it fresh. It's fun. Like I like researching. Like oh, well, I was a history major, but I like seeing oh, what was fun, and then coming up with sort of recipes that work like today that someone could actually eat and make and stuff. So I don't know. That's my side interest. <laughs> but um, yeah, I like. I really like creating the recipes and stuff. I. It's sort of like a artsy outlet for me. Yeah, I think it really shows in uh, the recipe selection, at least on the blog, um, uh, to kind of build off what Jeff just said. I noticed you had a crawfish and red beans recipe, and that just sounds so unlike most crockpot recipes that you see that are kind of the traditional, either, you know, a bean bean soup or no nothing wrong with that, but it just seems like you're, you're trying to really take it off in a different direction and, and use it as a, as a cooking method, as a technique, which is interesting. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's what I was trying. Crawfish was on sale at the supermarket. Right. <laughs> what can I say? I was like, oh, well, they actually have crawfish because we live in Baltimore. We get a lot of crab. We don't get a lot of crawfish. So I was like, oh, that's awesome. But you really can. I mean, anything that you kind of need to like sort of simmer for a really long time and you don't need a lot of evaporation. That's kind of the tricky part is you don't, you know, something can evaporate. So you don't want anything that needs to like stick in. So the beans are great for that. And red beans and rice was a lot of fun. Um, I made a Cincinnati style chili in the slow cooker. That was a really fun. Uh, I know it's on the blog. I think it might be a different version, I think, it's in the cookbook. But the original version's on my blog, I think. <laughs> Are there some general rules that people should follow if they're trying to take a recipe and and uh, transform it for a slow cooker? Yeah. Um, in my first cookbook, I kind of give some tips for that. Um, but basically, you have to keep in mind there's no evaporation. So you really need less liquid than you normally would if you're making something because nothing really is going to evaporate. Some slow cookers, Hamilton Beach makes some slow cookers that have teeny, I keep trying to do hand motions, teeny little vents at the top. And um, a little teeny tiny bit of evaporation occurs, but really virtually nothing. So you can't, you know, if a recipe is saying you need like, you know, eight cups of stock for a soup recipe. Well, maybe you really only need like six. And things really suck up the liquid. And anything that like cooks quickly, you need to add at the end, like seafood, frozen peas, corn, you know, like little teeny things you kind of want to add, add at the end, rather at the beginning, even if the recipe sort of calls for it. Uh, but basically, if you cut, you cut down the liquid, but you don't want to get too crazy, because some people try and do things like where they dump all the dried beans in and don't like pre-soak them. You generally don't have to pre-cook them. Um, but like sometimes people will be like, oh, I just dumped in the dried beans and extra half cup of water. That doesn't really work because it sucks the moisture out and the recipe doesn't really work. So you sort of have to think. Generally you can get away without cooking them, which I like because I don't like using dried beans because I'm too lazy to like boil them ahead of time. Um, so I normally just use canned beans in real life. But in the cookbook I tell you both and you can kind of go back and forth. But for some stuff you use dried beans, you can just soak them overnight in the insert, drain out the water, and then dump everything else in. And um, but they really do need to be soaked, so you can't go too crazy with the um, adding liquids, not adding liquids and stuff. But um, basically, nothing evaporates. Nothing's going to get brown. So if you want your meat to look nice, you probably want to brown it before you put it in, um, which I think sometimes helps with the flavor a little bit too. Depending. That's having a party over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tru truly um, a, a, a kitchen party. I know, literally. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. I apologize. <laughs> um, uh, Rachel, uh, no, I must admit, in, in some recipes, I do cheat sometimes, and I, I'll actually take the sauce out at the end of cooking and, and reduce it on the stovetop to use. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you know, that you've done in the past with your recipes? I've done it with some of them. One thing I've found that you can do, depending on what you're making, like I was talking earlier about making a... Um, Oh, a brisket taco. Um, sometimes if you put the sauce ingredients, you can almost put them on top, like if you layer it, and you can almost like scoop them off without having to reduce them depending on how chunky they are. So I've sort of done that. I've done some reducing. I'm not personally a super saucy kind of person, so I don't generally cook like that. And since it was my cookbook, I didn't, <laughs> like I don't really <laughs> like gravies and stuff. This is my cookbook. You know, I'm not a big finishing there. fan, you know, for the time it takes. You know, I'm not into a lot of having to do stuff afterwards or before. I mean, yeah. to me, yeah, I, I want to brown that brisket before I put it in. But that yeah, I always always kind of grimace at it going, but I'm cooking it here. <laughs> it's not, um, but uh, I will say like, things like pulled pork and, and pulled chicken and stuff like that where you're shredding the meat, I notice mm -hmm. that the sauce usually will get amalgamated with that pulled meat where it wouldn't with a 
you know, a one firm cut of meat too. So right, yeah. Well, and some of the um, recipes they had it with the idea that um, I have a couple where you're making like a separate sauce or something like that too, which is sometimes a little easier. Because sometimes what's left in a slow cooker is a little greasy, so then sometimes you then you have to strain it. And when you're writing a book, you're trying to think like some people are going to want stuff that like where they don't need any prep in the morning. Right. You're going to want some people who want to do no prep at night. You're going to want people who want to do no prep either time. Like, they just don't want to do anything at all. And which, some of the recipes are not really for you guys, because I was going for the healthy, so it's not the poor and dump. But, um, you know, I mean, there are ways, I think, too, to sort of streamline it. Like, I had somewhere, you sort of are pre-making the sauce, like, the night before or something. And what I do personally um, is I chop up all the ingredients the night before and put them in the fridge and then um, just dump them in the next morning so I'm not chopping up because I generally call for lots of vegetables and stuff like that, like so I'm not chopping stuff up at 7 o'clock in the morning. And that works just fine. You really shouldn't put meat and vegetables in the same thing because of cross bacteria issues. But, you know, I'll pre-season everything. I'll have the spices already in the slow cooker, so I just have to, like, dump stuff in. So you can kind of streamline it. Sauces afterwards, people kind of get a little, I'm trying to think of a nice way to put it, annoyed when you have them drain fats and food juices on the stove. People seem to find that a little offensive. So I try to come up with things where you don't have to do too much post stuff. Maybe adding more ingredients towards the end. You can add stuff to sort of thicken it up, too. Like, maybe you're adding pasta or rice or tapioca starch or something. Now, that, that kind of as, runs into the next question, too, is about taking the lid off the darn thing while it's cooking. You know, everyone will tell you, don't take the lid off because you're going to lose heat and stuff. I mean, how, how, how much trouble is that? I took the lid off a lot because I had to, like, check to make sure things were cooking and not getting disgusting or being weird. Um, it's like the worst thing. I mean, you generally don't want to take the lid off for a huge amount of time, but for the amount of time it takes to, say, stir it or something, it's not that big of a deal. And sometimes you have to. If you're adding peas or shrimp or, you know, whatever, fresh herbs or something at the end, you have to take it off and start and then maybe redo it. But I mean, every five minutes, you don't want to be, like, peeking at it. You don't have to start, like, continuously, unless the recipe calls for it. Like, I've made granola. You have to stir that. Um, there are some recipes that I made, like you are talking about, like with thickening to make more of a sauce. I've had it where you take it off for the last hour or something, and then it kind of thickens by itself in the um, slow cooker. So, you know, sometimes the taking it off can work. But, I mean, as long as you're not doing it constantly, I mean, I would check on it, you know, a few times over the cooking time. and it was. Okay. I know with my chili, which is what I traditionally, that's, that's what I first started to cook in the slow cooker and actually used the slow cooker cookbook as kind of the basis for ratios and stuff. How, how do you make chili? Because mm -hmm. I, I never liked my grandmother's chili, and I decided to make <laughs> a version that I would actually enjoy. And that actually, to this day, that is the basis of my you know super secret Christmas chili recipe that I put out to everybody. Does anybody, does anybody else have uh, this fear that I have with the slow cooker? I do not like leaving the slow cooker on and then going out to work. I am just, I spend the whole day at my desk waiting for the fire department to call me and tell me that my house burned down, even though I've never heard of a slow cooker accident. <laughs> I, I put it yeah, on my tile countertop, not underneath the cupboards, because I, I, I can get a little paranoid too. And uh, But yeah, I, I have a place where I can put it that I know it's not near anything, you know, dangerous at all. And actually, I mean, while the unit, at my unit, an older unit, does get quite warm on the outside, you know, it's not anything that's going to cause ignition of anything. I When I use a slow cooker, I cook it at night. I put it on before I go to sleep, and then I put it in the fridge in the morning. And so my husband says, how does that make sense? Because then the house is going to burn down while we're in it. <laughs> <laughs> Better if it burns down when we're not here. <laughs> Renee has trust issues, off. folks. Hey, Jeff, who's I your have trust first, issues. Jeff? Uh, I'd like to introduce, this is Judy Gallagher. She's a food blogger, food writer, food extraordinaire, superstar in Sarasota. Hi, guys. Judy, say hi, hi. Hi. Nice that's, to meet that's everybody. That's Babette. That's Doug. That's Rachel. That's Renee. That's us. Um, anyway, uh, we're here at Jack Dusty in Sarasota, and um, and anytime you come to Sarasota, you have to look up Judy and her writing on online because she's the absolute authority, and she's dipped me into the waters of Sarasota, and it feels wonderful. We've, we've eaten the Kool-Aid. We have Not just drunk it. We we've ate chewed the Kool-Aid. Dry packages. We've That's had dry packages true. of Kool-Aid. Ooh. Ooh. Hey, Jeff, how do we follow Judy online? Judy, how do we follow you online? 
Um, very many ways. You can go on sarasotamagazine.com and click on Foodie's Notebook. You can go on judygallagher.com. It's Judy with an I, and my blog is Scrumptious. I also am co-publisher of flavorsandmore.com. That's an international food and Pleasures of the Table magazine. I told and you. Of course, mysungoast.com, which is the ABC. If you go on mysungoast.com, click on recipes. It's Chef only Judy's an hour dish. show, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. My plugs are Listen, done. Listen, if you can't find Judy Gallagher online, you don't have fingers. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Google is broke. That's, that's what that means. <laughs> Hey guys, speaking of all on, I just want to kind of check in with our friends on Twitter who are watching. We have, these are all Twitter usernames, so I'm not going to say the at part. Uh, Sandy McKenna, Midlife Road Trip, Mitch Jenkins, uh, Judy, oh, Judy King Cook. That's not Judy, right? No, that's someone else. Um, My Man's Belly, who was a past. Hey, that's <laughs> Pat. <laughs> um, and then we got Tampa Wine Woman is always, uh, I'm Stuffed, which is Danielle here in Los Angeles. And then the rest of the team here, Douglas, I see he's been sending some tweets and posting some pictures. Remember, if you want to win a copy of Rachel's new cookbook, you're going to want to do, uh, you're going to want to tweet us with the kitchen party hashtag. And also you can tweet to Rachel herself. Uh, Coconut Lime is her username. And you can say that you'd like to win the cookbook or tweet a picture of your slow cooker. Which is kind of, I think, much more interesting because it'd be cool to see everyone slow cooker. Um, and you know, you you can. She's gonna probably uh, pick a winner after the show um, when she has some time to go through the feed. So make sure you tweet to us and use kitchen party hashtag. Um, I wanted to say we asked some friends, our community on Facebook, about their tips because we put out a newsletter today for slow cook, slow cooker recipes, um, and it seemed like everyone had an issue with cleanup. Do you have any tips um, for cleaning that up? Because they said that either you'd always be surprised at what sticks. You know, well, they have the slow cooker bags, but um, to be honest, I really don't use those. I generally just cook it right in a slow cooker and then soak it. The only thing you have to be a little careful is some slow cookers don't have glazed bottoms, so you can't like submerge them in water, or they might soak up water and then eventually crack. Um, I generally just dump water in, let soak overnight, and then clean it out. So I really do not have any good tips. Um, the slow cooker bags, I mean, people love those. Um, when you're, say, ready a cookbook with a billion recipes, it's a little cost prohibitive to, like, buy these endless lists. They, they do make cleanup very clean. I don't find it too difficult. Um, if we use Bartender's Friend to kind of scrub them down if we have to and scrub the outside. Which, and sometimes the inside, like the, where the insert goes into, gets oddly dirty, and I have no idea how because you're putting a clean insert into what should never be touching food. Somehow that gets dirty, but Bartender's Friend and Bone of Me really can clean that up. I generally just soak, and unless your slow cooker is cooking hot or you're cooking something for some crazy amount of time, it really shouldn't get too stuck, really. Unless you're making, like, I don't know, a sticky toffee pudding in a slow cooker or something crazy. Like, it really shouldn't get too, too stuck unless something's kind of being overcooked or you're not filling it the right amount. The slow cookers really need to be, like, three-fourths to two-thirds full to really work effectively. And when I've heard when people have said, oh, things are getting stuck, it's when they're trying to dump something for, say, a four-quart slow cooker and a six-quart, and so they fill it halfway, and then it's not cooking right. So I think that's a lot of the cleanup issues is not maybe filling your slow cooker the right way because it really shouldn't be sticking too crazy um, unless it's, you know, you're, say maybe your slow cooker so old the glaze is sort of wearing off or, you know, you're overcooking it or something like that. A good, good soak should pretty much knock it out. I'm lazy. I'm not doing a lot of scrubbing. I like to use like a silicone spray like a Pam or something on the inside before I put stuff in there. I think it makes it really fast cleanup. Yeah, yeah, that works well too. The time so I get cool clean up issues. Yeah, yeah. I've had a little bit of pooling issues, so I don't always yeah. recommend that for everything, depending on what you're making. Sometimes you kind of spray and it starts to ooze down by the time it's like cooking, yeah. for real. <laughs> Sometimes I get clean up issues when we, you know, we set a pot of chili out and people are serving themselves from it. You know, it's it's basically cooked all the way through, but it's a party, so people are walking in and, and spooning out the chili, and no one realizes, hey, you should turn the dang thing off at a certain point. Yes. <laughs> then you can kind of get some baked on goo there. But yes, the typical thing, I'm lazy too. Simply soak it overnight. It'll come off. It's pottery. Glazed pottery is an amazingly resilient uh, structure, and it will release the stuff eventually. 
Uh, we have a question from somebody on Twitter from uh, uh, Michelle at the Daily Waffle. She says that do you? She asks this of uh, Rachel. Do you find that um, older slow cookers run hotter than the newer ones? Do you have a thought on that, Rachel? They tend to, yeah. They sort of tweak the laws about how hot your slow cooker can be and how long the cord can be at some point, like in the 80s. So if you have an older slow cooker, lots of them run much hotter than today's. Um, there's some ways you can check. You can run your slow cooker with full of water and use a, um, can't think of the right word. Um, Insulin uh, thermometer? Yes. yes, some yes, sort yes. of thermometer. <laughs> <laughs> the kind you can just float in there. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? I can't think of what it's called, but you know what I mean, like a thermometer, and see what the temperature is. Um, off the top of my head, I feel like it's supposed to be 220 degrees for low and 60 for high. So you can kind of see if it's running hot or low. Um, but generally, I, I find that the older ones seem to run hotter. I don't have a lot of experience with the older ones because I wasn't born before they sort of started making them a little... Quiet you. <laughs> <laughs> I have one with a nice long cord on it, and I went. my yeah. mother-in-law bought a new one, and it's got this, this cord that's about this the long. Tiny down. Well, I have one. The one I got when we got married, which was 2005, um, has a much longer cord than my more recent ones I got when I was doing the cookbook. And that, I, I would think it was like the absolute longest the cord could legally be or something, because it's really long. And it's awesome, because you can kind of move it around. We don't have children, so I'm not like scalding people with chili. But, um, you know, the little <laughs> tiny ones, you have to really get them close to the outlet, so that yes. makes it a little tricky. But the old ones, some of them, it's like, it looks like it's like an extension cord, like it just keeps coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. some of them you can really, I mean, you can be like six feet away and be like dishing up your chili. Uh, <laughs> no, I will say, too, my older one does seem like it gets much warmer on the outside than a newer one. I think they also have to do with insulation of the cooking base itself. I think they figured out, you know, if you put a little insulation in these cooking bases, they're going to be a little more efficient. Uh, where mine is, I swear, it's just a bare metal wall that the crock pot fits into. Or it's, you know, there's like no insulation at all on it. Yeah, well, some of them, and now a lot of them, the heating thing is sort of like around the sides. I have one, my favorite slow cooker is the one where it's Hamilton Beach, and it's one base, and you can have three different size tops, and you can swap them out. Like, they don't all cook at once, but it comes with like a six, a four, and a two quart, which is awesome. Like, if you only have space for one slow cooker, you can have like, this amount of three, all in one. And it just all sits in a base. So that's one where it heats up from the bottom, and that's one of the ones with the unglazed bottoms. Mm. Not a coincidence. But um, that one is different. It works the same way, but it's wider on the bottom, and it's just like a big base. But the rest of them have the heat heats all the way around, so it's like more of a radiant heat. But a lot of the other ones, it was um, hot. Um, a lot of them stayed, you know, were the ones that traditionally cooked from the bottom, where I think people have more of a scorching issue. Yeah. So, again, if you're having problems with the cleaning, it might be your slow cooker is old, too. So it might be time to kind of upgrade. They're like 15 bucks at Target, so... Might be good to like kind of upgrade. <laughs> you could have my 1982 <laughs> crockpot when you pry it from my cold <laughs> den. <Exactly. laughs> it works. It works fine. That's good. But I get a lot of people right again, like, "Oh, hey, Rachel, I'm having problems with bottom scorching." It turns out their slow cooker is like from 1972. So when you're working with the 40 year old slow cooker, you know it's not like say a cast iron skillet, which is gonna like outlast you. You know it's an electrical appliance. You don't have a you don't have a refrigerator from 1972. You don't need a slow cooker from 1972 either. Might be time for an upgrade. Well, you know they have those slow cookers now that you know the retro ones that look like they came off Match Game with Gene Rayburn. You know. And, <laughs> That's what um, I was talking about earlier. That's the one yeah, I want now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know the other thing too is I mean we're talking about we're generally talking about the ceramic ones and everything. I have one that's a metal like bowl that fits in on like a hot plate and there's some things that I actually like to cook in that one and it's maybe what maybe two quarts uh, tops there's things I actually like cooking in there better than in the in the giant hot tub of death that I have uh, because <laughs> it, it actually lets some of the heat out and it doesn't overcook some things and I can kind of modulate a little bit um, and I whenever I see those in like a thrift store I'm like I'm buying that I don't care if my house burns down I'm buying that <laughs> you could do it overnight. That sounds like a really safe appliance for the overnight cooking that Renee was talking about. You know, we have modern smoke alarms. You we die have modern in your sleep. Yeah, and if you don't die in your sleep, you have breakfast. You know? <laughs> 
it makes you appreciate it more. I think that's the case, right? <laughs> Hey guys, we have about 10 minutes left of the show. Just want to kind of give you an update. Uh, and I want to make sure we get to um, Jeff uh, did some crazy stuff this week. I also shot some video at CES of some of the appliances we talked about l in last week's episode mm. with them on the show. And I want to show Renee the fireplace. Um, so I want to, before we kind of close out, uh, Rachel, can you stay for a few more minutes? And, and yeah. Okay, great, great, awesome. Um, we're, before we kind of shift gears for a second, where can people find you? Can they send you messages off your blog? Where can people ask you questions about slow cookers? And sort of what's next for you? Um, well, people can always contact me um, through the blog, which is coconutlime.com, um, and on Twitter, which again is coconutlime, not coconut and lime, just coconutlime. Um, and I mean, I'm on like everything Google Plus, Instagram. I have like almost 300,000 Google Plus followers, so you'd be in good company there. Uh, <laughs> but, which is strange. I get a lot of weird emails through that. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, any place you would contact me, I get questions about slow cooking all the time. So, right now, I'm thinking I want to do, um, next up, I want to do a cookbook that is not related to slow cooking. <laughs> I love slow cooking, but after, like, the 80th, down the, I mean, 100th, let's see, we're going on like 700 recipes or something. You start to want to cook something in a pan. Walk a cookery. Walk right. cookery. That would be the other, go to the other extreme. Stir fry. Stir fry. Yeah, stir fry. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to be raw food. It's going to be. Raw food. No. Yeah. So I, I think some other cookbook. But again, I do post three recipes a week on my blog every week. So I mean, I do that. It takes a huge amount of time. So um, most days I'm either cooking or washing dishes in my 1930s kitchen does not have a dishwasher. So, um, yeah, so we have, that's pretty much it. So I always do lots of recipes. I'm always happy for people who have, um, any sort of, um, questions or anything like that. I generally get people back even within 24 hours because I'm that helpful. <laughs> nice. I think we met because I, I, I have a, I think you joined Bake Space like in 2007 and I have just been following you forever and your blog and your tweets and everything you do is always uh, has been so great that uh, we're just completely delighted that you when we invited you you said yes you would come to Kitchen Party. Um, well, thank you for having me. Oh our pleasure our pleasure. So Jeff um, to kind of sh uh, shift gears a little bit, do you want to kind of tell us a little bit about what we're going to see, the video that you sent, and then Melody will actually play for it once you get done kind of kind of pitching. Setting it up. It's called <laughs> setting it up. Set up the clip for us. <laughs> well, I think this clip uh, I'm with Russell Crowe and we're like in an internet. No, I was, uh, judging a co I was judging a cocktail contest last night for Alibi Whiskey and because uh, that's the kind of great job I have. <laughs> and uh, they were creme brulee. They were, creme brulee. They were brulee a maraschino cherry that had been dipped in sugar, so that when you bit into it with the cocktail, it went crunch. crunch. Oh. So this is a video, and I hope you like it. Oh my god! Roll that tape. Oh, this wow. is the guy. There you go. He's he's got a blowtorch, which is always good for cocktails. There was some uh, dry ice in the cocktail, which was way cool, and he also smoked some grapefruit rind. So you got a smoky, citrusy kind of thing. So this was one Willy Wonka drink, man. This was awesome. Yes, uh, large flames and people who have been drinking. That's always a great combination, Jeff. Well, you know, <laughs> this is people I hang with. <laughs> wild man. So You're Jeff, was that like man. served on the side of the cocktail? How, how, how yeah, was yeah, it yeah. served? Yeah, it was like a regular garnish, only they had just brulee it before. And then when you, uh, when you went to bite into it while you were drinking, uh, it had a little crackle to it, and it was, uh, you know, it took the maraschino, and then it made it like candy, which is, I'm all in favor for. Oh, I'm candy, all candy, that, candy that. cocktails. That sounds like the one that Beth sent out earlier Ooh. this week with the Butterfingers and the Chardonnay. We have to try that. <laughs> Under duress only. Yeah. Under duress only. I don't think I have words for that. <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. That is the word. Wrong. I literally like, could not think of a word for it. Like I'm trying to think of a no. No, I got nothing. Well, Rachel, just to kind of get you up to speed, last week uh, we shot some of our show from Vegas at CES. I went there, and the folks at Google let us come into their innovation studios. And so I was in the studios, and the rest of our team was uh, where they're at: L.A., Tampa, uh, Burbank, and we. Um, 
we went around the, the, the convention center and they had all these great smart appliances. So one of the appliances, I don't know if Melody's going to um, start the first video, but uh, I kind of did a little bit of an audio thing in the video, so I don't want to reveal what it is because it's kind of <laughs> weird and interesting. Melody, can you do the one with the fridge first? All right. Please Maybe stand not. by. <laughs> Hello, kitchen party. Hey, I want to show you something really cool that I found at CES. This is a Whirlpool Cool Vox refrigerator. This is in white ice. It comes in white and black. But here's what the crazy part. You know how when you're at a party and you want to hear music and you have to like search through your iPad or bring your speakers in or you guys have to go into the living room to actually hear the music? This refrigerator is a giant speaker. This means you can actually, with Bluetooth, play your music or your dinner party in the kitchen. How cool is that? You can get this in white or black. There's also a very cool ice area. So you don't have to go to the freezer anymore. You can literally just pop this button, open it up, and pour the ice into your drink. So this is one of the great appliances we found, one of our favorites at CES. And uh, we hope you check it out. <laughs> and I just want to let Melody know that she spelled fridge wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, you didn't anyone ever tell you you're not supposed to point out things like Melody, that? Melody, <laughs> Melody. You were an English major, weren't you? Uh, no, I was not. I failed. I, no, I did actually. I technically did not fail, but I was not that great. In Wait fact, a minute. <laughs> I'm in a hurry. That's true. That's very true. Well, let's go to this next video. Is uh, remember we talked about the the new fireplace that was? It, it's a table that mm. is the dinner table that's been converted into sort of where you, it's like actually like an oven where you actually cook your food as well. The center is, well actually the video will explain it, but you'll kind of get an idea. What happened? Roll just, that tape. <laughs> <laughs> Roll that tape. Well, for some reason it's getting stuck. I don't know why. There it goes. Right. <laughs> Party. Uh, remember when we had our show last week and we were talking about this really cool fireplace where everyone can sit around and it will keep your food hot or cold? This is the actual fireplace. We're here at the Whirlpool booth again, and this is the fireplace that I found. In the middle is for cooking, and around the white, you're going to have different cups, and you're going to have different plates that are going to actually talk to the fireplace to let you know, is this cup supposed to keep cold? Is this plate supposed to keep hot? And so I think this is actually pretty cool. Um, it's a concept thing. It's in Europe right now. Uh, it is not in the States. This is sort of a futuristic look at to what our kitchen table is going to look like. And I'm really excited about that. I think families will sit around the kitchen table. I think they will spend more time talking and eating and having fun. And I cannot wait. I'm just delighted to see things like this starting. All right. So lesson is fix your hair, Babette. <laughs> <laughs> I think you looked great in both of those clips, Babette. We'll have the critique session after the show. That's right. After the you show. had so much fun on the floor. I mean, the world, pool, the world pool folks were very nice. Um, they had some other appliances. Uh, Rachel, they had this appliance that I, was, I could not find on the floor to save my life. It was an oven that was divided into two, and you could cook things simultaneously, so like a, a pie and then salmon. And the smells will not... Can you get a smell mingling? Yeah, exactly. And so that's like, that's like the new that's the new thing where you can actually cook multiple things at the same time. So there is some really cool stuff. Uh, do you have a um, we, we talked about what our appliance that we would love to have in our last show. Do you have a like a futuristic appliance that you wish could be created? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm really excited we got the fifth burner stove at our house, so we don't have a dishwasher. So, I mean, the music refrigerator is, like, a little, like, beyond the pale right there. Um, I don't know. I were, You know what I really want? Some sort of, like, uh, I don't know. You know what sounds really nerdy? But, like, a combination of that music thing and, like, a fondue pot. Could you imagine, like, the trippy 70s parties you could it's have? It's a 1970s that? all over again. Yeah. I mean, I think that would be, like, really fun. I think, like, the party sort of novelty thing, I think, is what, what secretly draws me in. I like a novelty appliance. So I would, Bell like... bottoms would and wide bottom. lapels, baby. I, I, I would get a kick out of that, I think. 
Well, you guys, I got to go to the Tasty Awards tonight, so I got to make sure we end on time because right now from 6 to 7, they're doing the red carpet, and I got to get to downtown L.A. by 7 o'clock or else the show is going to start, and I'm going to walk in like a fool. Um, <laughs> no, no, that, don't you know that's what stars do? They exactly. Walk in late. Everyone, look at me. Tasty Awards. Look at me. Look at I have it. Renee. I know, I know, I know. Bad. We're gonna see uh, who are we gonna see? We're gonna see average Betty. Average Betty, there. Yeah. We're gonna see food curated. She's mm -hmm. she flew in from New York. There's a few other people who tweeted me tonight, so it'll be very interesting to see who shows up. Um, Nadia G is gonna be there too, no? Oh, she is. I thought oh, I so. I could be that. wrong. I could be wrong. Oh, because she's the party honest. reunion. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm gonna bring my iPhone and I'm gonna see if I can take some video of some folks. Uh, we were nominated for. Um, Best food app. We did not win. Boo, boo, boo. But you know, it's it's always a pleasure to be nominated. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm missing a sense of conviction in your voice there, but <laughs> just well, saying. Rachel, will you do me a favor and will you pick a winner for your uh, quick will. giveaway? And we'll retweet that as well when you when you pick who's going to win. Um, you can pick whomever you want who used the hashtag, and then also. Um, Please tweet some photos of your crock pots. So, like, oh, yes. of the eight that you have, maybe like a few of your favorite that are you really because <laughs> we would love to see that for sure. I'd like right? to see the shelf of all the crock pots. Yeah, it's 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 insane. It really is. It's embarrassing, honestly. It's a little embarrassing. No, we're envious. We want to see it. We were envious. <laughs> and so, Rachel, we also like at the end of our our new thing for this season is. At the end of every show, we're actually going to produce a cookbook from recipes that are submitted by our fans. So we're, we're creating community cookbooks after every episode. Now, will you donate one recipe to our cookbook? See, I'm putting sure. you on the spot now. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing something like a, like some crazy reality show, like, will you do <laughs> Huh, Who yeah. is the father of that recipe? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think Jeff just got uh, booted out. His Wi-Fi probably gave up on him. Uh, but uh, we please do me a favor and uh, send me the recipe, and I'll add it to the cookbook. And then those of you who are watching at home, uh, if you download the app Cookbook Cafe uh, and search crock pot or um, slow cooker, in a few days we're actually we will put up the the cookbook. Um, but if you're watching this later on on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. Bake Space TV is our channel. And uh, uh, Rachel, what is your? Uh, you, do you have a YouTube channel? It's Coconut Lime. Okay, awesome, Coconut Lime. So also subscribe to her channel as well. Um, thank you, Rachel, for joining us. And you guys have anything else to say, Douglas and Renee? No, thank you so much, Rachel. This was fun. You have to come back sometime. I'm available. You know, this is it's a lot later here in in Baltimore than it is for you guys. So. But yes, of course. Well, <laughs> to, to close the night, I invented a slow cooker cocktail. This is not a cocktail you make in a slow cooker, but rather one named the slow cooker. It is warmed apple cider, apple brandy luck, calvados, a little <gasps> splash of ginger ale, and a little pinch of cinnamon on the top. Oh, that sounds awesome. And why are we not drinking this now? I know. Well, Next you're time. not. <laughs> 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 Hey, Douglas, can you put that that recipe up and then tweet that with the hashtag? For I tweeted it out earlier. I will send it out again uh, as soon as the show is over. Sure. Awesome. Wonderful, guys. Have a great day. We will see you next week, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. We will see you next Thursday. Thanks.